it's interesting. I didn't come from a family of sports fans. Um, I came from a family of musicians, and sports had little um, a, a role when I was growing up. Um, and maybe that's why I, I was drawn to it. You know, at, at some point when I moved to New York in the, in the early 90s, um, I had a good friend who started to take me to um, actually WNBA games at the Garden and also to, uh, took me to a couple of boxing matches, including um, some Golden Gloves matches, the amateur boxing um, competition. And I would find myself spacing out um, like I couldn't, like I didn't have a, enough knowledge or background to really be able to, to follow like sort of the storyline or like to be interested in kind of the technicalities of what was going on. So I would, yeah, I, I was more kind of spacing out on the scene and the spectacle of it. And um, it, 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 at the time, uh, it, was, it was not long after I was obsessed with a, a book of interviews with the painter Francis Bacon. Um, and something about that work just intuitively like spoke to me. Um, and I remember thinking in the garden that the scene of the garden, like the kind of the graphic quality of like the court markings and, and the architecture and then this kind of extreme uh, physicality and emotion, like this kind of hyper visibility of the athletes with everybody screaming at them, reminded me of like the, his paintings of the screaming Pope, um, which was an appropriation of the, you know, of, of uh, the, the Pope paintings by um, Velasquez. So um, that's where the title comes from. I guess a similar thing with, with video, I don't, come from a filmmaking background. My background is in, in is printmaking. Um, and what attracted me to printmaking, I think, is something about the, the mechanical nature of reproduction involved, and maybe also the, the relationship of printmaking to, to popular culture, to advertising. Like I associated, um, screen printing, which was my thing as an undergrad, um, not just with Warhol, but just with like some type of sign that you would just see in everyday life. And, and there was something just about the idea of uh, like hacking into kind of everyday consciousness or everyday experience that I think is why I was attracted to printmaking. Um, and, and I guess, uh, so, my, so my, the way that I got into video was actually um, because I actually was around when um, desktop computers started to be a thing <laughs> in the early 90s. And it's really, it's, to me, it's, I'm glad you referenced Dana Birnbaum's video I, uh, of Wonder Woman, because I remember her talking once about how she made that video and, and what it took to get the video off of like a VHS tape, um, it was extremely difficult. And it was kind of this mysterious thing, you know, to, to take an image from TV and to get it onto, into your studio and actually work with it, to me, it was like a really super cool idea. So, you know, the first uh, time that I saw Premiere, um, the video editing software, I was like, immediately I wanted to know about it. Um, and again, uh, I associate it with, with, I associate video as a medium with everyday experience. Um, and as Tyler said, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's something we take for granted. It's hardly worth saying, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, the architect Tafuri said that, TV is the architecture of the present. Um, and the way I think of that is that, you know, what, whatever the medium of video is, it's something that penetrates us, that 
shapes our consciousness that in some ways I think is mistaken for just simple reality. Um, and, and, and actually one of the things I wanted to talk about today, and I'm glad I can't read my notes because I would have talked about it too much, um, but I, I did want to reference um, an essay that I, was, I recently reread um, that dates from the 1970s, I think 1978, by Rosalind Krauss, uh, video on the aesthetics of narcissism. I wonder if you've, uh, if, if you've come across it. It's like a really, really interesting essay and, and one of the first attempts to create some kind of like dis discourse or, uh, or critical framework to look at video in the same way that you know, critics in the 60s and 70s were looking at um, painting and sculpture and conceptual art and minimalism, um, really taking these forms, these things seriously as having deep implications for not just society and culture, but, but politics. Um, and, and what Rosen Krauss says, I mean, first of all, she doesn't seem to like video very much. She compares it to narcissism, basically. Uh, but, but even before that, um, she, she's really saying what distinguishes video as a medium that, that really kind of breaks it away from the kind of critical framework that was being used around painting and sculpture at the time is that, I mean, if you think about it, at the time in the 60s and 70s, the discourse was all about uh, a kind of an attempt to be um, to resist the the pleasure and the spectacle of of pictorialism and uh, and illusionism and rather to to focus on the kind of the material reality of the medium um, as something separate from the free expression or even intention of the artist. You know, the artist was actually dealing with something in the material world. And so there was this idea of connecting that intention to not just create illusions, but to actually get to the material reality. Um, and in a sense, the political material reality, you know, undergirding the illusion. And, and to make the work reflect that. Um, and so in the midst of that come these first uh, uh, experiments with video from people like Vito Acconci and, uh, um, well, um, many others, Peter Campus, uh, Joan Jonas, um, I'm gonna forget all of them, but um, and she makes the point that, in a sense, you know, you could say that what makes video possible is the mechanical device or a series of mechanical devices, the camera, the projector, the DVD player, <laughs> or um, whatever the media player is. But um, really, these things, you know, are um, in some ways different from, say, like the support of a painting um, or the kind of the material uh, um, like the material structure or the materiality of, 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 of a minimalist sculpture um, it, it, it actually these the, 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 technic, the technical part of it is in a way rendered invisible so she proposes that actually the nature of video is that it's actually a psychological medium. And to me, this is like uh, a, a kind of an amazing idea. And in a way, it is to say that video is not so much uh, a discrete material as much as it is something that interacts with cognition and the psychological makeup, um, the kind of the subjectivity of people such that 
in a sense, video really, to work with video is to play with subjectivity directly um, or to play with memory and psychology. Um, and that just throws a wrench into certain distinctions that one would typically make in the 60s and 70s about you know, what makes for an ethical approach to art making versus one that's just about decoration or that you know, kowtows to the market. Um, you know, there was like a serious attempt to create work from a critical place. Um, but then how do you deal with that if you're not dealing with something um, material but something psychological? Um, it sort of scrambles the categories in a way. Uh, this is the mechanism, uh, or the, the Sony video projector, um, and the mount that it's on is like a security camera mount that I turned upside down. I got it from like the security camera store at, in, on Canal Street, which is still there. And for me, the, the, the idea of it was that uh, I mean, at, at, at that time, rather than making a big image, I thought that in some ways to like show this spectacular image of Larry Johnson screaming, um, that it should be something seen up close. And, and, and I like the idea that in a way by making the image small, um, it immediately becomes first legible as a, an object, like a sculpture or like a fetish. Um, even before you see what the image is, and that, in a way, casts it in the language of sculpture rather than video, in a way. And I, I also thought a, the similar thing about that loop, which is true. I mean, it, it's hard to imagine, but at the time, um, a, a looping structure like that wasn't something that you would see everywhere, the way that it is now seen everywhere. Um, it's, it's almost like the predominant uh, like temporality of video um, now. Even news comes in these like sound bites that, that in a way loop. Um, but at that time I thought, you know, to, to, to show a short loop like this that just went backwards and forwards, um, it takes it out of um, a linear narrative and in, 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 in no longer being a linear narrative, it then becomes like a painting in the sense that it doesn't go anywhere. It is just an image that has a structure that you can observe for like a minute or for 10 seconds or for an hour and it, it only displays its structure um, rather than taking you on a, uh, through a storyline. And, and I like the idea that somehow by just by using the loop, it would, uh, again, kind of uh, create the space of awareness or, or of concentration associate or, or of... Um, of looking associated with painting rather than with film in a movie theater, something like that. That previous video was the first video I ever made. <laughs> this, uh, the second video, this was the first. Uh, and the title of this one is The Pure Products Go Crazy. Um, and I guess the thing I, that, I wanna, that I wanted to get to is that, um, like I, I generally work through a process of subtraction, you know, taking images or taking uh, samples from somewhere and then um, not adding to them, but just, just removing elements. And somehow I connect the effect of this on a psychological level to um, what I associate with um, something like 
um, the uncanny or um, like cognitive dissonance, um, which I guess in, in, in psychological terms would just be uh, where the thing that you repress because you want to deny it, the only way that it can come back is as something alien or something foreign. It's actually coming from you, but it, because you've repressed it, it comes back as something foreign. And um, there's a lot of stories about the uncanny in, in the studies of Freud and, and, and others that associate um, this repression and this return of the uncanny element um, with um, domestic ar architecture, I mean, with the home, the space of exactly the most familiar and the most supposedly safe. Um, uh, that's just to show you a scale relationship. Um, this is a piece called John 316, um, and it's displayed on a pole. Um, and the screen itself is about like this size. This just continues to loop. Actually, I'm going to come back to that because um, it's a longer piece. I'm going to just run through these. Um, The other thing about printmaking is that, you know, you construct an image by kind of breaking it down into layers of either uh, colors or um, other elements. But this idea of, of, of constructing an image in layers, uh, to me, immediately applied when I saw, uh, um, you know, Photoshop or and, and premiere um, for the first time. And I mean, I use the term erasure because to me, psychologically, that's, you know, in, in, in a sense, I think that, you know, there's certain, like the brain is not neutral. There's certain things that it tends to do. And one thing that it tends to do is it tends to gravitate and fixate on an object. So in a way to like, an object out, um, like scrambles the brain's natural tendency to like form or make sense of an image. Um, I guess that's the logic of camouflage. But in fact, it's, it's um, technically speaking, it's not so much an erasure. It's, it's actually a process of like layering parts of the background over the foreground image. So, um, This is, um, it's part of a trilogy. I'm just showing one. Um, it's a trilogy of fights um, of Muhammad Ali um, from throughout his career that was marketed in the 90s by HBO, I think, as like Muhammad Ali's greatest fights. And so I made a video for the last round of each of the three fights in that trilogy. I think this one is um, the Rumble in the Jungle, 
which was uh, um, a fight against George Foreman that took place in Zaire and was, I think, the first time that an event was live broadcast internationally. That's the knockout. That, that last video was uh, titled Live Evil, which was uh, borrowed from a Miles Davis album title. And this one is uh, called Desiderata. Which is like this, uh, I think I know it as a kind of a, a very typical tr or like traditional American Protestant kind of poem slash prayer that you, I think circulated as this kind of card um, and that people used to carry around with them. Um, my dad did and it was about basically how to live an ethical life and how not to be distracted by the spectacle of the world. Oh, desiderata is Latin for things to be desired. It's all footage from The Price is Right. Um, and again, just the logic of subtraction. It's taking out the host, taking out any, anything that would have helped to give a sense of what, what was being said or what people are doing or what the motivation is. Um, and so it's kind of all of these in-between moments where I thought of them as being kind of like, um, like screen tests, just like studies of the awkwardness of people in front of the camera. It's funny, this, this is footage generally, I think, from the 80s or maybe the 90s. If you watch Prices Right Now, um, you would rarely see this. I mean, it's really striking. Prices Right started in 1972, and in 1972, um, there were long silences where um, people just were super awkward. Um, in 2017, everybody knows how to perform for the camera. There's almost zero awkwardness. It's sort of intu common intuitive knowledge, like ha what happens when you go up. I mean, of course, you also have like YouTube people study this game through YouTube before they actually go to Hollywood to become participants. So in fact, the audience now is extremely studied. And that's how it's presented. I mean, I basically started with, with um, using found footage 
but then, you know, not coming from a film background, I, I'm like, I really, I fetishize film and I really, like I continue to seek to know more about the techniques used because it's, I find it extremely fascinating, techniques of manipulation. Um, and so I hatched this plan, this is about 10 years ago, to um, make a recording of the, of, of the entire life cycle of a wasp nest to give wasps as um, creatures that really only cohabitate with, with humans. It's at least certain kind of paper wasps, which this is um, basically build their nests out of, of newsprint or like human uh, detritus. Um, and so they're commonly found around like human dwellings. So this video was shot um, in real time over uh, three months and then plays back. And over the course of three months, you can watch this queen wasp build a colony and lay eggs and then her army grows. But uh, I like the idea that um, um, you would have to almost like live with the piece in a corner of your house and let it play, you know, to see it unfold. Like you can't really see much at any given moment. And then, yeah, that's the, this cart was used to both shoot and, and then play back the video. I like the idea of this somehow, the, I guess similar to like the thing coming out of the wall, it's sort of putting the, the apparatus like right in the middle so it becomes an object in itself. I only brought one picture of this, but it's a, it's, it's a, um, it's a sculpture called Vitruvian Figure and, um, it's hard to tell. It's meant to look kind of like a, a kind of a, a fragment of something when you first look at it. Um, and uh, it, it is, in fact, um, sandwiched by these glass panes that are um, mirrored on the inside. So you can see in, but like if you went around to the back and looked in from one perspective, um, you would see that quarter stadium reflected to create a whole, sta a whole stadium form as a kind of partial illusion and partial physical object. Mostly what I want to say about this is uh, I'm showing you a thing that I can't really present here, um, which represents uh, that I've been moving more and more into to playing with sound. Um, and you have to take my word for it because it, it wouldn't make sense to really like play the sound for you here. It's the sound of a crowd. Um, and uh, it's a piece called uh, The Saints, which um, was my first real big experiment with sound and with filmmaking. And, and what it was was, um, it, was uh, it came from an invitation to do uh, like a site-specific work in London. and. Um, and to choose a building in London as the site, um, a, a group called, an organization called Art Angel um, um, commissioned it. And so I chose Wembley Stadium. And, and uh, the idea, like what I, just, what I found out is that it, as like a birthday thing, you could um, get access to Wembley Stadium, like you could, your, your, kids, you could take them to Wembley Stadium on their birthday and have them walk onto the field like they, the way the athletes do, and they would blast the sound of a crowd out of speakers that are going 360 around the stadium and get like the feeling. So uh, I had this idea, kind of inspired by that, um, to recreate the sound of the crowd at a very specific football match, the 1966 World Cup, which doesn't, 
means so much to us here, but is practically sacred to um, the English because it's the only time they ever won um, the World Cup and they invented the game. Um, and it was played in 1966, it was played against West Germany. Um, and so it had very intense historical resonance because it wasn't just the football game. It was less than 25 years after the Second World War. And so really it was like um, full of ghosts of, of, of uh, the Second World War. And um, the crowd was getting really nasty. And the English were chanting things like, we won the war. And um, um, I mean, in a sense, like, you know, a football crowd is, is almost like a war crowd in the sense of two sides kind of very intent on like facing each other. Um, and so, so um, to make this, I, like I wanted to actually get the specific chants and songs, like have the historical specificity of the actual chants and songs that were um, sung during that match in 1966. And um, so the way we did it was to, um, hi I, I went to the Philippines and, and hired a crowd, like a crowd of men, a thousand men, um, and, and rehearsed them in a, like in an IMAX movie theater in Manila. Um, first, the English songs, the English national anthem, God Save the Queen, and then um, Deutschland über alles and, and, and all of the German anthems. And, and then we basically made like a, an eight hour game out of performing all the different songs and, and then we mixed it together. So what's playing in this room, <laughs> to me, sorry it's a long story, but uh, is this, it's, this is actually the Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin, um, a very historically resonant building and there's this intense sound of, of the 1966 crowd with Filipino accent um, playing in this empty room. That's one of the speakers. And then at the very end of the hall, if you walked, it's not quite a football field, but almost, um, there was this tiny monitor. Oops, sorry. And um, playing on the monitor was just this video of the 1966 World Cup um, with all the players removed except one. So it was this British football player kind of running around the field by himself and like falling down every once in a while. And then a lot of people didn't actually get this far, but if you happen to go behind the wall um, with this little monitor on it, there's actually a secret room back there. And there was like a full documentation of the crowd of a thousand men like performing in the IMAX movie theater in Manila. Um, And these are, just to show you some, it's been shown several times and each time it's, it's basically just an empty room. I'm just gonna show this a little bit. It's, this is a, um, a piece called Orpheus Descending and um, it was done in 2001 in the World Trade Center. I, I think it might've been the last artwork to be displayed in the World, Center, World Trade Center um, before, before the collapse. Um, and similar to the, the Wasps, it was a, a two and a half month video showing um, just the life cycle of chickens, uh, like a flock of chickens or a brood of chickens. The first two weeks were just the eggs incubating and then the eggs hatched. And then day by day, you watch them um, grow up until they were adult chickens. Um, and it was really meant, just to go back here for a second, um, the idea sprang from, you know, at the time um, that Lower Manhattan Cultural Council had studios on the 100th floor, and, and I, I had a studio there in, in uh, 2000, and um, 
it was amazing. I guess you can still see it down there. Um, you know, commuters at like rush hour, just thousands and thousands of commuters. So really the idea was that this video was for the commuters. Um, this is a, um, a second Vitruvian figure um, sculpture that was much more process oriented. Um, it, it was, the idea was to, um, to this is a piece that was done for the, um, the Sydney Biennial in 2008, and um, the idea was to, to take the Sydney Olympic Stadium and expand the design of it um, with the, through a collaboration with the designers who built the Sydney Olympic Stadium. Um, the actual Olympic Stadium holds 100,000, and so we expanded it to hold a million people, like a theoretical million, million seat stadium and then to actually build a model. And to do that, uh, I went back to the Philippines again and hired a, an army of people to build it. The seats are really tiny, but even at that tiny scale, the thing as a whole was pretty big. Uh, I just wanna show you this one last piece. Um, it's a recent piece and it's, uh, uh, getting deeper into sound and the way sound is produced for movies. Um, uh, and it's, um, I don't know if you know, like, you know, sound, soundtracks for movies are, are produced um, using um, like a, a, a process where people in, will, will actually create every sound that you hear in a movie that, and, and nothing is actually natural every single sound is produced and then mixed in. Um, it's a really painstaking process. I, I didn't know anything about it, I, but I heard about it. And, and so I uh, went to, well, I heard about it. Somebody told me about uh, um, that one really beautiful Foley soundtrack or like special effects soundtrack is, is um, the soundtrack for the movie In the Mood for Love, um, Wong Kar Wai. And so I went on a search to find the, the, the sound artist who made the soundtrack for In the Mood for Love. And it turned out they were in um, Bangkok, in Thailand. And um, so with their help, I approached them and, and um, with this idea to create the soundtrack uh, to recreate uh, a soundtrack for um, a boxing match, um, the 19, I mean the 2015 fight between Manny Pacquiao and Floyd Mayweather. So this is what it is. I'm just gonna like play a couple of short samples of it. <laughs>
โอ้วิ่งจ็อกกิ้งเลยครับเราจะมีอีกหนึ่งผลิตภัณฑ์ถ้าคุณอยากให้ผมแชร์อีกหนึ่งพูดอย่างเดียวเลยครับตัวไหนฟุตฟุตเท้าหน้านะนะหรือฟุตเท้าที่เวียงฟุตเท้าโน้นนะครับผมโอเคแป๊บนะต้องเป็นเท้าโน้นแหละเนาะต้องเป็นเท้าโน้นเออเท้าเนี้ยเนี่ยเท้าตรงนี้เท้านี้มันยกพุดหนึ่งครับซ้ายตึกตึกตึกตึกตึกตึกตึกตึกน้ำหมดยกครับโอเคครับมันดูเยอะไปนิดตัวช่วงนี้อาจจะปิดปิดอยู่กับที่เลยก็ได้ครับนั่นแหละอีกทีนะครับครับครับโอเคแป๊บนี Okay. Here, I'll, I'll end with this. Just.
so it just loops. Um, I'm going to end there. Well, you know, my parents were back actually specifically both uh, church musicians. And so, yeah, I grew up um, listening to a lot of sacred music. And so I associate in some ways, you know, the, the use of music um, in the church to me is similar to the use of images in the church in that they... Um, You know, I mean, obviously, they, they are used to, um, I mean, to me, two of the places that are intrinsically tied to the evolution of, of video as a medium um, are sports and religion. Um, um, and so there's uh, something about, like, using music and or using sound and using... Um, images to speak to people on a uh, something more than just a verbal level, on an emotional, like on the level of affect and, and in some ways to me on a, a subliminal level. Um, it might seem like a, a weird place to take it, but you know, I, I was a kid when, um, well, one of the most important movies, I think, in the 70s um, was The Exorcist. Um, the, the Exorcist in 1973 um, won one Academy Award, and that was for the soundtrack. Um, and um, for me, it, it describes how sound was being experimented with um, in the early 70s, um, overlaid with a kind of religious metaphor to it. Um, the, the, the other thing that my parents were involved in was uh, um, in the latter part of their lives, they, uh, my, my father um, what became a student of ethnomusicology. And in, in the 70s, there was like a, um, a lot of people were fascinated with, with the, the idea of, you know, with, with recording technologies then available People wanted to record the music, the popular music of, of kind of smaller communities um, or, or tradition, musical traditions that were not from the centers that were, but were from the margins. And, and my, my dad actually in the 70s was uh, involved in, in making field recordings of, of indigenous music in the Philippines. Um, and um, his sound recording studio, when, when I was growing up, was right next to my bedroom. And so, um, like, I uh, heard a lot of sounds that s did not sound like Western music, um, were in fact almost, you know, it was like a kind of um, history telling, you know, like uh, uh, elders in, in small communities would, like, be the keepers of the history of the community and would like basically chant it for several days during special occasions. And my dad would record it and it just was otherworldly. So I, to me, there's definitely a connection. I, in some ways, I, I think that sound is a dimension that is, that, you know, is absolutely linked with moving images and is in a way it's the invisible um, part of the production of, of moving images. You know, like, obviously the images are visible, but there's just as much happening uh, on a sound level, but we don't really think about it. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not just me. I think, um, I think we're, we're all deeply affected by sound. And I'm in, in, in a way, I'm interested in sound in the same way that I'm interested in video. I, I, I think that, um, we're talking about psychological media or psychological mediums. And in a way, it, it, there's an implication to it that also um, 
that we as um, people are like receivers. Um, and so in a way, like if, if, if music and moving images are psychological media, then in some ways, um, in relation to these things, we become um, like mediums, like uh, penetrated and inhabited by messages coming from invisible sources, <laughs> which is kind of the theme of The Exorcist. Um, <laughs> it's always struck me, I, I, I had too much I wanted to show, so I didn't show it, but uh, it's, it's been always fascin fascinating to me that, uh, um, you know, one of the things that really freaked people out in The Exorcist was the sound of the voice of the devil that came out of the little girl. And um, this is probably like one of the first instances in cinema history where um, the use of the human voice played backwards was used. Um, basically, the, the voice of the devil is human voices in a collage format, many human voices being played backwards. And the reason I know this is that there's a crucial scene in the movie where they actually reveal the trick. You know, it, but it's done in such a way that it, it doesn't sort of break the spell. It actually intensifies the spell of the movie. Um, the priest records the little girl after throwing holy water on her. And she's making these really strange sounds. And then when it's played back, um, it's discovered that, that if the recording was played in reverse, then these human messages could be heard. Um, it's fascinating to me because in a sense, like in that scene, they are revealing, you know, like kind of like the Foley artists, like how the sound is made. Um, yeah, well, um, I mean, in some ways it, it describes a kind of a, well, to go back to the, the Rosalind Krauss essay, there's, you know, the beginning of the essay really um, is, set, is a setup in which um, she describes the, 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 the tradition of critical art writing in the 1960s and 70s as one in which a connection is being made between aesthetics and ethics. Um, to be ethical and sort of right on as an artist um, was um, to be not swayed by um, the illusionistic, you know, uh, possibilities of, of um, say, painting um, or image making. And it was, in fact, you know, and, and also not to participate in it. Um, in a way, a division was made between, I think, probably, you know, w much more of a division was made then between sort of the aesthetics of, like, of Hollywood and, and, and of pop culture and the kind of more purist and critical intentions of, of art making. It's hard to imagine, but, you know, in, in the essay, she actually describes uh, not just that, but, but an intention on the part of artists in that generation to resist and disrupt the, like the market appropriation of art and the, the, the turning of art into commodity, co commodity fetishes. Um, so in a way there's this intention that through certain modes of art making, you would actually not fall into the patterns, but actually find ways to disrupt the, the perceptual patterns um, that at the time were perceived as sort of appropriating and taking over the, the rightful role of art in society. To me, it's hard to imagine because I think that now we sort of take the market for granted as almost like a bottom line um, not just as artists, but as people in society generally. Um, so it's extremely hard to like wrap one's mind around, um, I don't know, like 
a time when that wasn't sort of, you know, the overwhelming case. So I guess, you know, for me, there's like uh, an interest in these experiments to, um, to play with dynamics that, that um, you know, that shape our lives. And I would even go as far as to say that, you know, in choosing particular images, say like from sports or um, from other situations, there's like a desire to not further objectify, but to actually take images in which people are already objectified and to, to try to pull something out of a pre-existing con con, uh, um, condition of, of kind of, of con uh, commodity fetishism. It might, it's, it's maybe a little counterintuitive, but um, historically speaking to me that, you know, uh, um, a place like the Philippines, which is um, like one of the, uh, is a primary site in, in the global labor market. Um, you know, there's national programs to encourage it, in fact, um, which is one of the reasons why I went to the Philippines to hire a crowd of a thousand people. You can do that there. Um, but I guess one thing that interests me is that um, historically there's a very deep connection with the United States, with, with American culture um, in that part of the world. So in an elliptical way, to me, doing this, I mean, following this route and pursuing this gesture is, is actually a way to get to the heart of American culture. And, and really my interest is in a way the, the kind of um, like the mythology and the image world of American culture. Yeah, I'll just say, you know, like right now I've, I'm, um, I am living part time in in um, the in Georgia, in um, the American South, and um, I've been um, shooting football games down there uh, um, at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, um, big football school, um, and yeah, like it's a, it's an amazing scene, and it it definitely I mean with with university support I've managed to get in and and with press passes and and shoot a bit behind the scenes and it's it's a massive uh, broadcast studio, it's super fascinating. There's one thing I wish I could have done. Um, we were gonna try it, but uh, you know the thing that is unfortunately not reproducible in this situation is that um, it's not just two images and they would really be like two images on two big screens like this, but it's also two soundtracks. Um, it's only, you know, like I, that's why I didn't show the Filipino crowd. Similarly, I almost didn't want to show this because um, in an actual installation format, um, there's a kind of rhythm um, where you're going in and out of the fight in real time um, or going from the fight to the studio where the fight is being remastered and um, installed in, uh, you know, really installed the, um, there's a bodily dimension to that sound like you, you know, you really hear a kind of um, spatial um, like distribution of the sound in the room. And uh, I think it, you know, it, in a way it was unexpected to me. It, it does certain things. It, it causes your body to uh, move left and right. Hard to uh, reproduce here though, or impossible to reproduce here. Um, sure, um, well, 
one, one dimension of the, the, the project in Georgia is um, it, it, um, had to, it started with the, the, the band um, that performs during the football games. And um, when I started going to the games, I noticed that they have this very strange performance um, in following um, Southeast Conference football rules. Um, the band is not allowed to play while the ball is active, um, but then they must play immediately when the ball is dead in order to hype the crowd. So they develop this technique where they are able to start and stop um, on a dime. And they never finish a song because the action is moving too fast. So they, throughout the course of like a three hour game, they're sort of playing these, um, you know, they're, they're like variations of like uh, Protestant hymn um, tunes. Uh, and they're constantly interrupting the songs um, and st starting and stopping. And, and so I was originally going to shoot them specifically. Uh, and I noticed that the director of the band was wearing a headphone uh, or a headset. And I eventually found out that he's connected to, he's one of three people in the stadium who are orchestrating the entire spectacle. So what I'm really doing is I'm shooting these three people behind the scenes who are uh, sort of producing uh, the football game on a kind of emotional and, and like sensory level. That's what it is. I'm turning my back on the game and actually, you know, in a way, I'm focusing on these behind the scenes things going on. To me, objects are very interesting because, you know, I deal with erasing objects. And so to me, they're, you know, things that appear very solid in, in and object-like um, in a casual way, um, when you really study them, they become really interesting. And, and that goes for objects, and in a way it also goes for, like, people. <laughs> as, you know, if you think of a person as being, uh, having a kind of independence from their surroundings, and having a kind of individual identity or agency. Um, I think the closer you study it, and certainly if you, you know, like watch people creating soundtracks to be seen, you know, by movie theater audiences, um, there's just, there's a, um, a very deep level of like sensory manipulation that goes on that suggests that, that the individual is much more porous, like a sponge, than we would first appear to be. So I'm, to me, in a way, like sculptural objects are an opportunity to explore that dynamic. I think you know, to create an object is in a way to like, study not just what an object is, but what an individual is, you know, um, what their relationship is to the background or to their surrounding and how they're perceived or consumed um, perceptually and what their makeup is. Like I think, you know, things kind of become like much more um, like fragile and, and, um, and elusive the closer you study them. Uh, in some ways I think like, you know, yeah, to, to, to play with I mean, really, the typical place way to experience film would be in relation to like a custom-made architecture, like a movie theater. Um, but then, so in that sense, it's not really made for a gallery. So to bring video into a gallery immediately raises questions about form and what the sculptural aspect or the, I mean, to play with video and even more so to play with sound in a way that's what i wanted to show like really to play with sound in a in an art setting is really to play with architecture um, and i would say in some ways you know um, 
that's how I think about objects. Like I would like sometimes to lend video an object status by encasing it in an object. Um, and I think you can do that. You know, in some ways it's interesting to think of like, I mean now, you know, you can make photographs in the mode of paintings and you can make videos in the mode of sculpture. It's like uh, interior design, like the structure doesn't have to be the same as the surface. Um, and to like play with these different categories in a way, um, to me, that's what's happening. 